Today we're going to look at part of a story that you may have heard about before. The story has been made into movies, it's been referenced in TV shows, and you'll see ideas from it in all sorts of places if you pay enough attention. This is a very popular story, and yet it's a bit strange that so many people like it, because one of the main things that we learn from this story is also one of the most offensive ideas in the world today. Maybe you'll remember from a few videos back, but at one point in history, Abraham's descendants were living in the land of Egypt, and by this time they were called the Israelites. Well, after living there a while, the Israelites were enslaved by the Egyptians, and they were kept there as slaves for 400 years. But God knew what was happening, and he decided to set them free. God sent a messenger, a man named Moses, to tell the Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. And to show the Pharaoh who the God of Israel was and what he could do, God also sent a series of plagues on Egypt. God turned all the water in Egypt into blood. He sent waves and waves of frogs, gnats, flies, and locusts into the land. He covered the Egyptians with boils and he killed all their livestock. And he sent hail that destroyed the crops and trees the Egyptians needed for food. And he covered the land in a darkness that was so dense and so complete that people couldn't even see each other in the middle of the day. But the Pharaoh still didn't fear God, and he still didn't let the Israelites go. So God warned the Pharaoh that there would be one more plague, and if things weren't uncomfortable already, this is where they might start. God said that, at midnight, he would go through the land of Egypt, and every firstborn in the nation would die. Every firstborn in every family, every firstborn of every animal, all of them. Yikes. Now, the Israelites obviously still lived in the land where this was going to take place, and God wanted to protect them from what was coming. So God told his messengers that every family should take a lamb without any flaws, that they should kill it, and that they should wipe the lamb's blood on the doorposts of their home. And God said that when he saw the blood on the doorposts, he would pass over that house, and everyone inside would be safe from what was going on. So the Israelites did what God had told them to do, and that night, when God passed through the land, things happened exactly as God said they would happen. At midnight, in every single Egyptian house, somebody died. But in every Israelite house, in every home with the blood on the doorposts, the people were kept safe. And there's something that we see here that goes against much of what we're told in the world today. The Bible doesn't tell us uh, what everyone else in the nation was doing while these plagues were happening, but I don't think it's too much of a stretch to suspect that they were probably doing the same things that many people do today. Like humans do today, many of the Egyptians were probably praying to their own gods, each trusting in one or several of the many gods that they believed in. They sincerely thought that their own gods had the power to protect them, and they tried to do everything that they thought that they were supposed to do so that their gods would act. But no matter how sincere the Egyptians were in their belief, and no matter how hard they worked, it didn't make any difference. Because there's only one god who exists and only one God who matters. And there was only one way that this God had provided that could save them. One part of the gospel that's especially controversial in the world today is the idea that repenting and trusting in Jesus is the only way that we can come to God and the only way that anyone is saved. Jesus clearly states in the Bible that the only way people can be saved from their sins, the only way they can have life, the only way that they can come to God is if they come through Jesus himself. This is not what people like to hear. It's a popular idea right now that all religions are true, uh, or that all religions are just different understandings of the same core idea. In this understanding, everyone's allowed to know God and approach God in whatever way they think is best for them. But there's a problem with this idea, and the problem is that it simply isn't true. If you compare any two religious systems with any detail, you'll find that they don't just have different names for God, if they even agree that God exists. But they also have different ideas of who God is, uh, what God wants, where humans go when they die, and how humans get there. One religion may teach believers to love their enemies, uh, while another may tell followers to kill everyone who won't submit. One religion uh, will say that no one can earn forgiveness, while other religions will tell their followers that they need to earn God's forgiveness, or else. It's not possible for all religions, or even multiple religions, to be true at the same time. It doesn't make sense to say that all religions point to the same God or the same truth because different religions point in wildly different directions. So you may be wondering why this idea is so popular if it doesn't make any sense. 
well, the idea, uh, the lie, that multiple religions can be true is popular because it's comfortable. It's popular because believing this means that we don't need to worry about if we really know what's right and wrong. Believing this means that we don't need to disagree and have awkward conversations with people who think different things. Believing this makes it easy for us to think that we're loving because it's much easier to just be nice to everyone than to tell them difficult or painful truths. But if what Jesus says is correct, then letting people believe whatever they want is not only misguided, but it's also extremely unloving. Let's look at the story we were discussing earlier. Knowing that the prayers of the Egyptians would go unanswered, and that the Israelites would be saved by following and trusting their own God, what would you say to the Egyptians? Would you tell the Egyptians not to worry? Would you tell them that their beliefs were just as valid and true as the beliefs of the Israelites? Would you tell them that they and their children would be safe uh, as long as they were sincere? No, you probably wouldn't, because that would be a lie. To tell them that would be to cheer them on towards their own destruction, and that would be a downright evil thing to do. And uh, just as it would have been back then, so it is today. As he did in Egypt, God has warned us that something is coming, and he's revealed the way that will keep us safe. We can either do the comfortable thing and let everyone else ride happily into hell, or we can do the loving thing and point people to the only thing that will save them, which is the sacrifice that God has provided. When the final plague had passed through Egypt, uh, the Pharaoh couldn't take it any longer, and so he gave in and he let the Israelites go free. In a similar way, when we trust in Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, we're not only saved from a terrible punishment, but we're also set free from our slavery to sin and brought into eternal life with God. God has given us an amazing gift, and we can only receive this gift through repenting of our sins and trusting in Jesus. So are we going to look at this gift and say, you know, I want this, but I want it another way, so no thanks. Or are we going to look at this gift and say, I need this, so I'll take it, no matter what else it costs me. Here's one last thought to help you out. Imagine you were on a sinking ship with nine other passengers. Now imagine that you look around and there happen to be ten lifeboats, one for each person on board. Uh, however, as you watch each person get into their own lifeboat, you also see that every single one of these lifeboats has a big hole in it, except for the last one. What would you do? Would you join one of the other passengers in a damaged lifeboat because you don't want to do anything to make them worry? Would you refuse to use any lifeboat and just go down with the ship because it's not fair that one boat works while the others don't? Or would you get in the correct lifeboat, tell everyone else that they're in trouble, and invite them to join you? I think it's fair to say that, if we're being honest here, we know that we should go with the last option. Now, at this point, you might feel like you need to do a little more research before you can trust that Christianity is the right lifeboat to be getting into. And if that's the case, then that's okay. We encourage you to do that research, and we'll even help you with it if you want. But something that's important for all of us to remember as we think about these things is this. It may make you uncomfortable when Jesus says that he's the only way to God and the only way to life, uh, but the fact that Jesus' words make you uncomfortable doesn't mean that he's wrong.